Good morning. The uh, subcommittee will come to order. I would thank you all for being here. Uh, one of the priorities of the subcommittee is to ensure that the U.S. maintains a modern, safe, and efficient aviation system now and into the future. Our current system simply cannot meet future air traffic demands. Over the last decade, the FAA has been developing and more recently implementing a program to meet these demands, um, generally known as NextGen. Um, let me be clear, I completely support the NextGen program. I'm very fortunate to represent the FAA Technical Center in my district, which is the nation's premier aviation research and development test and evaluation facility, and the primary facility supporting NextGen, as well as many other vital aviation safety initiatives. I've seen firsthand the development of technologies at the Tech Center that are now being deployed and in use in the national airspace system. These technologies, many of which contributed to the survival of so many passengers, passengers aboard the Asiana Flight 214, are improving the safety and efficiency of civil aviation system. That's why I believe that the validation and testing of NextGen and other critical safety and modernization initiatives should continue to be conducted at the Tech Center. However, I also know that there are serious concerns regarding the FAA's ability to effectively and efficiently implement NextGen. I've heard that some transformational next-gen programs aren't truly transformational, that the FAA will never make the tough decisions required to advance next-gen, and that nobody can really agree what next-gen is today or what it should be in 2025. These concerns should not be downplayed, ignored, or outright dismissed. Whether or not you agree with them is not relevant. We and the taxpayers, more importantly, and airspace users, have invested billions of dollars in NextGen, and it is clear that billions more will need to be invested. Every concern should be acknowledged, reviewed, and properly addressed. I also want to make clear that I am not pointing the finger at any specific person uh, for perceived or actual problems with NextGen. In particular, um, uh, Administrator Huerta, this is, this is not directed at you, but the NextGen program is a decade old, and there are a lot of people that share the responsibility for what has taken place or what has not taken place, including people within the FAA, the aviation industry, and Congress itself for what we maybe have not done or not done as well as we should have done. The Inspector General is, in general is here today to outline a number of problems with advancing NextGen that he and his inspectors and auditors have identified. I look forward to hearing his findings and recommendations. This report provides an opportunity for all of us to hit the reset button and make sure that we are headed in the right direction in the most efficient and effective way and with the best outcome. We have to plan appropriately, in particular with the upcoming budget constraints, which could have a big impact on all FAA operations. I expect DOT Secretary Fox, Administrator Huerta, Deputy Administrator Mike Whitaker, and industry stakeholders to work together to get the program back on track, yielding the benefits that all of us want to see. Most of you know that by now my door is always open, and if there's anything that I can do, or more importantly, we as the committee can do, uh, we hope that you do not hesitate to ask. I also want to add that um, I work very closely with Congressman Larson uh, over the years, and especially now with this session of Congress with this aviation subcommittee. I think we're of exactly the same mind with our focus and direction and how we'd like to see things move forward. Uh, so with that, um, Rick, I'll now yield to you for your opening statement. Thanks, Frank. And I want to thank the Chairman for calling today's uh, hearing uh, to review uh, the implementation of NextGen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you and, I, you and I have led this subcommittee for only a few months, but I believe we're both committed to making sure that the FAA's NextGen effort succeeds, and this subcommittee must provide the FAA with the authority and resources that it needs to be successful. We also have to provide vigorous oversight to ensure necessary corrections to guarantee NextGen stays on track. And if you'll allow me just to uh, divert briefly from my prepared remarks in looking at the testimony of both uh, Administrator Huerta and Inspector General Scoville, uh, it reminds me of a term that <clears throat> I think law enforcement uses to describe when two or more people look at the same crime scene or same crime incident <clears throat> and, and conclude 
two or three or four very different things happening. It's called the Rashomon effect. And reading, these, reading the testimony it, uh, from both folks, it seems like two people are looking at the same thing and coming up with two very different conclusions about, uh, about what happened. Now, the term Rashomon is from the movie uh, by Akira Kurosawa, some might know, called Rashomon. And it, it details a very tragic, uh, uh, a tragic uh, incident that happens. And it really gets down, in the movie, it really, the, it, it sort of devolves into the cesspool of existentialism about what is the truth and what is the meaning of truth. I hope we don't get to that point in this, te in this hearing about what is next gen and what are the concerns with it. Otherwise, we may be in a lot of trouble. But I do think that we have to provide some pretty aggressive oversight to get at what are the actual problems and what are the next steps that we do need to take. The FAA has clearly made some progress in its efforts to implement NextGen. For example, the agency has advanced the um, ADSB program that will be the NextGen satellite-based successor to radar for tracking aircraft. The FAA has deployed more than 500 ADSB ground stations and is on track to deploy all 700 ground stations on time in early 2014 but it has experienced setbacks. According to the Inspector General, a $330 million cost overrun <coughs> and four-year delay on the ERAM, or en route Automa Automation Modernization Program, has delayed the start of, ne of new next-gen programs. And after examining the Inspector General's report, I'm concerned that without changes, delays in next-gen may force us to rename it last-gen. We have a lot of work to do. The FAA's approach to implementing next-gen has changed since Congress tasked the FAA with transitioning to NextGen a decade ago. For example, in 2005, the, uh, the administration at the time requested and received cuts to the FAA's capital account, leading to the termination of some early efforts to achieve NextGen capabilities. In 2009, FAA shifted its strategic focus to delivering NextGen benefits to airspace users in the midterm 2018 timeframe. The FAA took this action at the urging of industry stakeholders who participated in the RTCA's midterm implementation task force. Yet, while the FAA has been working to maximize early next-gen benefits, the Inspector General will testify this morning that the FAA has not made several key long-term decisions that will ultimately shape the capabilities, timing, and costs of next-gen. So therefore, I look forward to hearing Inspector General Scoville and Administrator Huerta's explanations of the reasons why these long-term decisions have not been made. Additionally, I want to hear how the FAA intends to respond to budgetary pressures that will undoubtedly affect future next-gen implementation. In May, the Chairman and I hosted a next-gen listening session where industry participants told us the FAA stood down its next-gen Metroplex initiatives due to sequestration. In response, I wrote to Administrator Huerta to ask him to explain that situation and have yet to receive a formal, uh, formal reply. So I do look forward to hearing Administrator Huerta's um, answer, providing the subcommittee with an update on this issue. And last month, the House Appropriations Committee reported an FY 2014 Transportation Appropriations Bill with historically low capital funding levels for the FAA. H.R. 2610 would provide $2.1 billion for the FAA's facilities and equipment account for 2014. That represents a 22 percent, uh, that, that's uh, 22 percent less than the administration's request. Moreover, it is a cut below the 2013 post-sequester funding level and the authorized 14 funding level this committee provided in the FAA reauthorization. The House Transportation Appropriations Bill would provide the lowest level of capital funding for FAA since the start of the NextGen program and the lowest level since 2000. Clearly, the administration is expecting budget cuts to have a significant impact on NextGen. Last Friday, Administrator Huerta asked the RTCA Advisory Committee, the NextGen Advisory Committee, to develop a prioritized list of NextGen activities that will be triaged due to budget cuts and sequestration. And I want to hear the Administrator's explanation why he asked the NAC to undertake this project and how it will influence the next-gen strategy. On a positive note, we now have stable leadership for, next, for next-gen that we have not had in the past. Administrator Huerta, who led the next-gen effort for years, was sworn in for a five-year term as Administrator late last year. And just last month, the Obama Administration appointed a Deputy Administrator who will serve a five-year term as the Chief Next-Gen Officer as required by the FAA bill. Mr. Chairman, next-gen success will rely on a strong partnership between government and industry. As an airline industry veteran, Deputy Administrator Whitaker is well positioned to reach out to the industry stakeholders and leverage the collaboration needed to move next-gen forward. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide an open statement and look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Okay, uh, thank
Thank you, Rick. Um, with that, I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material for the record of this hearing. Without objection, so ordered. Um, now I'd like to uh, turn to our panel. And uh, first, Administrator Huerta, uh, welcome, and we look forward to your statement. Thank you, Chairman Libiondo, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today on the progress we are making with NextGen. Mr. Chairman, before I begin my testimony, I want to express that our thoughts and prayers are with the passengers and crew of Asiana Flight 214 and their families. I am sure the Committee appreciates that the ongoing accident investigation is in the early stages, and I am not able to speculate about the cause of the crash. The FAA is fully supporting the investigation of the National Transportation Safety Board, and we will continue to do so throughout the process. We are also fully supporting the NTS NTSB investigation into the crash of an air taxi in Alaska earlier this month. Our thoughts and prayers are with those families as well. And we are participating in the investigation of the fire aboard the Ethiopian Airways Boeing 787 in London last week. The FAA has sent a specialist to Heathrow Airport in support of the British Government's investigation into that incident. Safety is our mission at the FAA, and we are working to continuously enhance our policies and procedures. Last week, we issued a new rule requiring more hours of experience for first officers who fly for U.S. airlines, and we are also requiring that first officers earn a type rating, which involves additional training and testing specific to the aircraft they fly. The next generation air transportation system is helping us to enhance safety and efficiency by transforming our aviation infrastructure. Next gen technologies guide aircraft on more direct routes. They save fuel and decrease delays. That is not only good for the environment, it saves the airlines money, and it is good for business. We are delivering the objectives of NextGen as promised. We have consistently met more than 80 percent of our implementation milestones over the last five years, which is extraordinary when dealing with a complex technological program. Overall, NextGen is on track. And yes, there have been delays, but we have learned from these and incorporated those lessons in the way we move forward. We are making all of these improvements in a very dynamic operating environment. We found that collaboration is the key to success and to providing the best benefit to all stakeholders. We have a detailed plan to implement NextGen, and this plan is integrated into our enterprise architecture for our entire national airspace system. At the same time, we are flexible enough to adjust our course. This approach is working, and we are delivering benefits to our stakeholders now. A good example is Memphis, where we have increased airport capacity by more than 20 percent since last fall. By working with our partners, we were able to revise wake turbulence separation standards. This allows aircraft to safely depart, one behind another, slightly closer together than before. In Atlanta, we worked to safely allow jets to take off on headings that are slightly closer together. This small change has resulted in a 10 percent increase in departures per hour from the world's busiest airport. We estimate customers have saved more than 11,000 hours of waiting in line to take off last year thanks to NextGen. We expect these improvements will save the airlines $20 million this year in Atlanta alone, and we intend to bring this type of efficiency to other major airports. We have brought together all of our stakeholders, airports, airlines, our air traffic controllers, managers, and other Federal agencies to decrease congestion in the airspace over busy metropolitan areas nationwide. Through the Metroplex Initiative, we are working in North Texas and Houston, Northern and Southern California, Atlanta, Charlotte, and right here in Washington, D.C. Airlines flying into the D.C. metro area have started using these next-gen procedures. We estimate they will save $2.3 million in fuel per year and cut greenhouse gas emissions by 7,300 metric tons. And these benefits will increase as we develop more procedures. Just as industry depends on us to deliver the best benefits now, we depend on industry to share information with us to help us measure the benefits that NextGen provides. As I said earlier, collaboration is key. Only by investing the time, dedication, and commitment, we will continue to see the best benefits. Mr. Chairman, last year Congress reauthorized the FAA for four years and laid out a vision with bipartisan consensus to address the future needs of our aviation system. These needs have not gone away. Yet under the sequester and the current climate of fiscal uncertainty, the FAA needs to make sizable budget cuts that affect our operations, next gen, 
and our future. This uncertainty undermines the roadmap that the FAA and Congress laid out for NextGen. It was only last year that we all agreed that these goals were extremely important to protect the great contribution that civil aviation makes to our national economy. We are fa facing many challenges, but we must stay the course. Our aviation system needs these improvements, and the cost of not doing them is far greater than the cost of moving forward. It is important for us to work together to ensure that the United States continues to lead the world in aviation technology. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared remarks, and I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you, Administrator Huerta. Our second witness today is Department of Transportation Inspector General, Mr. Calvin Scoville. Uh, Inspector General Scoville, you are recognized for your statement. Chairman Lobiondo, Ranking Member Larson, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify on FAA's NextGen program. Transforming our nation's aging air traffic system is critical to meet the increasingly complex demands on airspace while maintaining the highest levels of safety. While FAA has made progress since it launched the program a decade ago, such as responding to a government industry task force, publishing a rule on ADSB, and establishing a new organizational structure, many next-gen initiatives are still in the early stages of development. My testimony today will focus on three priorities for advancing next-gen addressing the underlying causes for limited progress, maximizing near-term benefits, and successfully implementing critical automation systems such as ERAM. A number of weaknesses have contributed to the problems in advancing NextGen. FAA's original plans for NextGen contained in its 2005 progress report to Congress did not establish priorities, fully develop requirements, specify how technologies would be developed or integrated, or address implementation costs. By 2009, both FAA and industry agreed that FAA's initial goals of completing NextGen by 2025 with a budget of $40 billion would not be possible. Developing adequate plans with realistic expectations remains a challenge, largely because FAA has yet to make critical design decisions that will serve as the foundation for NextGen's future. For example, FAA has yet to decide on the level of automation needed to manage air traffic and how much responsibility for tracking aircraft should be delegated to pilots and what should remain with air traffic controllers. These decisions will significantly impact next-gen requirements, capabilities, timing, and costs. Organizational instability and gaps in leadership have impeded implementation and further undermined FAA's advancement of next-gen. Establishing clear lines of accountability and authority will be key to securing progress. FAA's recent reorganization, the third in less than 10 years, is a step forward to improve NextGen's management, but ultimately the key to success will be in FAA's plans and execution. Securing stakeholder buy-in is another significant roadblock to advancing NextGen. Industry representatives and other stakeholders continue to express skepticism that FAA will be able to deliver planned capabilities. Until FAA clearly defines how next-gen technologies will benefit users, air carriers will remain reluctant to invest in costly next-gen equipment. A key component to gaining user support for next-gen will be integrating new performance-based navigation routes and procedures at major airports. Navigation procedures such as RNAV and RNP can provide significant near-term benefits, including reduced congestion, more direct flight paths, and fuel savings. FAA has made progress in designing new advanced routes at busy airports. However, implementing them has been delayed due to obstacles such as a lengthy procedure development process, outdated controller procedures, and limited training for controllers. Moreover, air carriers are not widely using procedures that have been implemented. For example, at the six large airports in Chicago, New York, and Washington, where FAA has implemented curved runway approaches, only about 3 percent of eligible flights have used them, due in part to a lack of tools to help controllers manage aircraft using varying routes and equipment. Finally, next-gen success will depend on effectively implementing automation systems for controllers that will enable key next-gen capabilities, including the use of satellite surveillance and data link communications. For example, FAA's efforts to modernize automation systems at 11 large terminal facilities may cost much more and take longer than estimated 
because the agency has not finalized software and hardware requirements. FAA faces similar challenges in implementing its multi-billion dollar ERAM system, which processes flight data at en route facilities. FAA has worked hard to resolve previous software problems, and controllers are now using ERAM at 16 of 20 sites, at least part-time. However, considerable work remains to complete the effort by 2014 as planned. In addition, the ERAM contract currently costs about $12 million a month, and if the contract burn rate does not decrease significantly, FAA will need additional funds to complete the program. NextGen is at a critical jun juncture. Near-term operational benefits are needed to gain industry confidence in FAA's plans and encourage users to invest. Sustained leadership with clear lines of authority and accountability is key to developing an executable plan that is linked to the agency's budget and that resolves underlying causes for delays. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my prepared statement. I would be happy to answer any questions you or other members of the subcommittee may have. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scovel. Um, Administrator Huerta, um, the, the FAA Technical Center um, has been the primary facility for testing and evaluating next-gen technology, technologies. Do you see that role changing for the Tech Center in the future? I don't. The Tech Center has serves a very important role for the FAA. It is our principal test bed. It is the place where we test um, deployment of new technology, where we do a lot of human-in-the-loop simulations, and where we run operational tests. I don't see that changing at all. Okay. Um, the FAA is, is blessed with uh, great talent at many different levels. And I've, I've seen the uh, outstanding work sort of up close and personal and the dedication at the Tech Center. Um, how does the FAA plan to continue to utilize the expertise at the Tech Center to advance next gen? Well, the Tech Center serves for us our, as our principal test and evaluation platform. And in that capacity, what they play is an important role in integrating the deployment of technology into the actual operation that uh, is, is ultimately going to take advantage of this. NextGen is more than just a technological platform. It actually has to be workable for the users of the system. And so in addition to ensuring that the technology will be useful for supporting um, our needs for air traffic in the future, we also have to understand what all is involved in making it operational within the real world environment. And that's where the human in the loop piece comes in. The Tech Center really is the place where all of those things come together, and where it, which enables us to make the determinations and, um, and the decisions as to how we actually deploy technology when it's ready to be fielded. Um, I hope you can clear something up for me. On a couple of previous occasions, uh, we've asked you about the status of the facilities realignment and consolidation plan, which is required under the uh, Modernization and Reform Act. Uh, and I believe you indicated that the plan was underway and that the FAA uh, was looking at the whole country, in other words, to be a very comprehensive plan. The IG's written testimony, he indicates that the FAA has scaled back its plans and will focus only on an integrated facility in the New York metropolitan area. Could you clarify for us what the FAA is doing in terms of developing a comp comprehensive plan and uh, how that meets with the mandate? Sure. Those are two different things. Uh, for years, as you point out, um, it, we have looked at the question of how to realign and consolidate our aging facilities. And we appreciate the thought and vision that went into the process that was outlined by Congress, and we recognize that you provided us with an important tool. As I have testified previously, we do have underway a very significant effort where we are looking at the whole country and uh, what we are doing is that, as you know, we have had difficulty in achieving consolidation of facilities in the past. And so to address the previous shortfalls that we have had in this area for facility consolidation, the FAA has taken a holistic approach, including our workforce and subject matter experts in developing the process and recommendations that will guide realignments of future facilities. We have an, a multidisciplinary work group of FAA and workforce representatives, and they are developing a process and recommendation for evaluating our existing terminal air traffic facilities for potential realignments. 
The draft uh, process and initial recommendations have been briefed to several industry stakeholders, inc including the National Academy of Science, Sciences and the National Customer Forum, which includes representatives of the airlines and of general aviation. Now, I recognize that developing this approach has been slower than what Congress has asked for. It has also taken longer than I would have wished, slowed in part by uh, the management and uh, financial challenges that we have faced. That said, we are creating an approach that has the ability to deliver much more efficient and effective infrastructure for the FAA. I am anticipating that uh, we will be working with you here in this committee in Congress and the aviation industry to evaluate operationally viable scenarios for facility realignments and consolidations, and we look forward to briefing the committee on this. Thank you. And the, uh, the last question, uh, Mr. Werther, which I, I will ask you to, uh, for the record, uh, to provide the subcommittee in writing with a detailed status, um, and that is on performance-based navigation, uh, mm -hmm. I think we all can agree that's a cornerstone of NextGen. When you testified before the subcommittee earlier this year, you stated that the FAA's two reports on implementing performance-based navigation as required under the Modernization and Reform Act were forthcoming. So if you could provide to us in writing in detail, we would appreciate that so we can review where that is. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, I have, uh, Mr. Scoville, I have questions for you, but in, in deference to the other committee members, I'll now turn to Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'll actually start with uh, Inspector General Scoville. Um, in my opening statement, I discussed the uh, proposed House Transportation Appropriations Bill to provide $2.1 billion for uh, facilities and equipment account for FAA. If enacted, that would represent the lowest capital funding level for FAA in the history of the NextGen program. Uh, in your view, how would that, those proposed funding levels uh, continue to affect the implementation challenges that exist in NextGen? Mr. Larson, we have conferred with uh, FAA on that specific matter as well as your staff. Our understanding is that at those funding levels, the agency would be required to constrain its efforts um, greatly in regard to NextGen and, in fact, would have to devote all of its attention um, and much of its funding permitted by Congress to simply sustaining the current system as exists in the NAS. Uh, Administrator Huerta, um, could you comment on, the, uh, uh, on my question as well? Uh, as you know, there are various components to our budget. The House bill increases operation, operations funding enough to maintain day-to-day -day NAS operations, but it does jeopardize both near-term and long-term capital investments that are needed to rebuild the aviation system in, in the future. In particular, as the Inspector General pointed out, the facilities and equipment account is where we have the greatest concern. Um, $623 million below the request and $439 million below what we have in fiscal year 2013. The House level would provide the lowest f and &E funding level since 2000, as you pointed out in your opening statement. It includes both targeted and undistributed reductions specifically. $259 million of targeted cuts, of which $43.6 million or 4.7 percent is from next-gen programs and $214.9 million, or 11.6 percent, from legacy programs. But there is also $364.3 million of an undistributed reduction. And alternatives for this al re allocation are being developed by our capital team. Now, what this forces us to do is to make trade-offs between continued maintenance of the current infrastructure and next-gen modernization efforts. The focus would need to be that a state of good repair is maintained and next-gen capabilities supporting information sharing and programs that are nearing completion in fiscal year 14, which provide near-term improvements, would be taken to completion. However, the next-gen programs just getting underway would likely need to be suspended. A next-gen slowdown would affect the economy. An Aerospace Industries Association study found that a reduction of 30 percent in the next-gen funding could result in up to $40 billion in lost economic output by 2021. It could cost 700,000 jobs by 2021 and as many as 1.3 million by 2035. I recognize these are difficult trade-offs, but as I said in my opening statement, it winds up costing far more in the long term if we, uh, if we uh, delay now. And those, uh, the, the budget numbers are numbers you lay out before 
the 2014 sequestration numbers kick in? This would, yes, this is based on the House mark. Now, um, under, under a sequester scenario, um, there are fl different flavors of it, and part of it depends on how the appropriations bills come out for the entire government and wh whether they are consistent with the Budget Control Act. Yeah. Okay. Um, under a scenario where we would start the year on a continuing resolution with no anomalies, um, in, in, in an F and E context, we would actually uh, be somewhat better off than this, but far worse off in the operation account. Yeah, right, right. Um, last Friday, you asked the RTCA Next Gen Advisory Committee to develop a prioritized list of next gen activities that would be triaged due to budget cuts and sequestration. Would you explain why you asked NAC to undertake that project and how it will influence FAA's next gen strategy, Administrator? We have had a lot of discussions in our industry consultation through the NAC and through others about uh, the general climate of fiscal uncertainty. And as you and the chairman and other members have all mentioned, we are operating under significant fiscal constraints as a country as a whole. And the industry has, and we have agreed that it would be prudent for us to have a clear sense of what are the key priorities that uh, we need to ensure have the maximum focus as we enter this more uncertain fiscal climate. As a general matter, I think that uh, we all agree that we are in a far better place un in a constrained fiscal environment if we are focusing on a state of good repair and perhaps needing to consider doing fewer things but doing them well and seeing them through to completion as opposed to an across-the-board reduction, which only has the effect of delaying everything and jeopardizing benefits for, uh, the delivery, uh, for delivery to the aviation community. What we're asking the NAC is, as an industry group, which represents air carriers, general aviation, uh, suppliers, manufacturers, where do they think the greatest focus needs to be placed in order, um, as we consider the trade-offs here, what advice would they offer us on what our highest priorities should be? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I get to a second round to the extent that other members don't touch on the differences in testimony. I'll, uh, I'll explore that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. We'll now turn to Mr. Williams. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, both of you for being here. Thank you today. And uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm from Texas. I'm a business guy, and I look at everything like a business. In my district, I've got uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport and Austin Bergstrom among a lot of smaller ones, so I'm rooting for you. Uh, but I have a question, two questions, actually, uh, to you, Administrator. Uh, in reading the IG's comments, they mentioned about organizational culture has been slow to embrace NextGen's vision. Uh, and as a business guy, when you, when you don't believe in the product, it's hard to sell it. Or it's hard to get involved in it. Uh, one of the things I know about that, because I still use this flip phone, and I need to get away from it. Uh, and uh, so what are you doing to have your, have your folks understand that this is the future of where we're heading and to get them embracing it. Thank you, sir. I'd like to answer your question in two parts. First of all, the question of why is it the way it is and then what are we doing about it. I think it is important to recognize uh, that the FAA is governed very much by a safety culture. Everyone is very focused on maintaining the highest levels of safety in our aviation system. And that what that leads to is a level of caution against uh, trying things that are different for a very important reason. Uh, individuals are concerned about messing something up. There is a system that provides the highest levels of safety, and there is a general belief that we, do, we want to ensure that in deploying anything new that we're not in any way compromising safety. That's not to, um, that's not to recognize, or that's not at all to suggest that things don't need to change. We can always raise the bar on safety, and change is a big part of that. What we have found is that the best approach is through the collaborative processes that we've implemented in the last couple of years, working with industry and working with our own workforce to actually do the very hard work of grinding through, here's what we want to deploy, what are the questions, concerns that everyone has, and responding to them in a real-time uh, real way. That's what is the approach that underlies how we got ERAM back on track, where we're now operating it in 16 of our air traffic control centers. 
that is the framework through which we're deploying advanced navigation procedures in North Texas and elsewhere, and we're actually reducing the time associated with the delivery of those procedures and directly addressing the point made by the Inspector General that uh, publishing a procedure alone is not enough. You actually have to work with the operators to ensure that they have the tools that they need to actually deploy it. What we're finding is we need to work with all of the stakeholders. We can't simply publish a new procedure and just issue an order and say, make it happen. We really need to work through the full scope of the operation, and we need to be responsive to uh, the questions and concerns that, that are raised by all the stakeholders in the system. Well, get them going. I'll, get, I'll, dump, I'll dump this flip phone if you get, if you get next gen cranking, okay? That's a deal. All right, second question. Uh, I'm also concerned as a business guy about what we see in uh, what we call organizational instability, which the IG also talked about, inconsistent leadership surrounding the program. Uh, I know that you've had some, uh, you're filling some administrative, uh, administrative areas, uh, but it's been slow in doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, can you explain why there's been so many reorganizations and are we moving in a direction where we're going to have a, a full team? I can uh, speak to what's happened over the last couple of years uh, that for those that I have been a part of. But uh, what we have done was, when I originally joined the agency as deputy administrator, it was with the thought that I would oversee the next-gen portfolio. And as you know, I stepped into the acting administrator role uh, soon after that. Uh, since then, um, uh, FAA reauthorization called on us to appoint a chief next-gen officer. We did bring in a new deputy administrator earlier this year once I was confirmed as administrator, and we did name Mr. Whitaker as chief next-gen officer. He is now in the process of filling out his team, and uh, we're very close to uh, naming a new, head, a new assistant administrator for next-gen, part of the organizational restructuring that the IG touched upon that we implemented a couple of years ago, which was very focused on elevating the profile of NextGen, taking it out of the ATO, and ensuring that it had the specific authority that the IG has mentioned in his testimony to, uh, to work across all the lines of business of the FAA. I think that uh, we are actually making very good progress. It's taken longer than I would like. Part of that was driven by uh, the fact that for a long time I was two-hatted, uh, serving both as the administrator and effectively the CNO. But I think that we are well launched to uh, getting to uh, where we need to be organizationally. It's good to hear. We, we need nine men on the field to play. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank appreciate you. you coming by. Appreciate your testimony. How are you back? Thank you. Mr. Capuano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I've been hearing about next gen since the day I got on this committee, actually a little bit before that, and it sounds great. And I'm one of those supporters because pretty much everybody I've talked to looks me in the eye and says, great idea, great program, I'm for it. But I'm starting to wonder. I mean, it's taken a really long time to roll that out. Uh, everybody seems to be dragging their feet, not just the FAA, if you want the truth. Everybody's pointing at everybody else about somebody else's responsibility to pay for this or get this done. And I'm, I'm starting to wonder to myself, especially now with sequester, if we're not going to be able to do, if we haven't been able to, and we're not likely to be able to do what we had originally wanted to do, why is it time to just kind of take a deep breath, not because the program's, are, uh, because the project uh, or the proposal is a bad proposal, but situation has changed. There's obviously more problems. I mean, I, I like the idea that change in these kinds of things takes second place to safety concerns. I don't have any problem with that concern, but it's obviously not what I had been led to believe 10 years ago or six years ago or two years ago or six months ago. Is it not time to just kind of take a deep breath and for everybody just to relax, step back, look at where we have been, look at the monies that we currently have, look at the problems that we have already faced and encountered and still face and encounter and say, you know what? Maybe we have to make it a little longer. Maybe we have to focus it on a few airports first. Maybe we need to do something different so that we can actually live up to the expectations that we set forth. And, and, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't even think it's an anti-business thing. Uh, there isn't a businessman in the world that I know of that hasn't made a uh, change in their investment plans or their business plan because they run into unforeseen obstacles. Uh, and, and I don't personally think that's a criticism of the proposal. I don't think it's a criticism of anybody or anything. It's just, just an acceptance of the reality. And, I, and I'm just wondering what you think of that, that concept, Mr. Administrator, the, the idea of taking a deep breath, kind of getting everybody back in a room again and say, okay, here we are today. Here's where we all want to go. 
how do we, from this point forward, not based on a plan that was put together 10 years ago or two years ago, how do we get from where we are to where we want to be with the lessons we have already learned, including the financial restraints that we now face? Sure. Thank you, Mr. Capuano. The plan that the FAA has developed is designed to have an overall architecture, but to be flexible to respond to what stakeholder requirements are and realities of how the industry is developing. And so we think that, I think that we're actually in a good place based on the investments that we have made over the last 10 years. Over the first 10 years, a lot of the focus has been on foundational technologies. What does that mean? the basic building blocks and platforms on which we build advanced capabilities over time. So those are new automation platforms for our en route and our terminal environment. We talked about ERAM. We talked about how we had, uh, we had some hiccups on that, but we have addressed those. Uh, we're doing the same in our terminal program. We also mentioned ADSB, which is a foundational technology. That is the GPS-based technology that enables us, that ultimately can replace radar across the country. But we Mr. are. Mr. No. If you have all the technology in the world, but people refuse to use it or won't use it for any number of good reasons. No. But let me come. But let me come to that point. Well, because I'm running out of time. Okay. <laughs> well, the the point is that what that now enables is for us to focus on delivering benefit. And the big focus for the last year has been on performance-based navigation. That for the airlines and the users of the system is a huge benefit because it's a reduced, it's reduced fuel burn, reduced cost, and, um, and reduced environmental emissions. And what, that's what our Metroplex initiative is all about. Let's take advantage of the investments we've made to date. Let's focus on delivery of benefits while in parallel we're looking at the longer term initiatives. Thank you. Mr. IG, would you agree with that statement? Would you agree with that approach? I'd agree with the approach that we're at a critical, crit, excuse me, a, a critical juncture and that to some extent reset is required. My, my caveat, my reservation is that if reset is to extend an appreciable length of time, that industry and the taxpayers will become even more frustrated with the situation that we find ourselves in today. I think essentially FAA is well positioned under the leadership of, of uh, this committee and in close collaboration with industry to make just the kind of reassessment that, that you have suggested, Mr. Capuano. Um, new, new leadership is coming in. They have established pretty good ties, my office believes with um, the NextGen Advisory Committee, the RTCA continues to function with them. Um, the, the move last week to request priorities from the NAC, we heartily applaud. It's much needed, especially in this fiscal environment. I would urge the committee to hold FAA's feet to the fire now with the new leadership coming in um, and to instill, as, as our statement um, suggests, a new sense of urgency into NextGen which has been lacking for much of the past decade. FAA has had a luxury of being able to proceed across a broad front. Now they have to narrow their attack along specific lines, and together with industry, they need to identify those, Thank you. PBN being the, the first and foremost. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you both for being here. Uh, Mr. Ward, I, I wanted to follow up on some of your written testimony. I think in your written testimony you said we've been transparent from the very beginning about what we intend to accomplish, and, and yet here we are some 10 or 11 years later with, with very little to show for it. You know, in 2004, we talked about the, the transformation of Americans' uh, airport network. And then 2006, we talked about an aviation revolution. 2007, a wide-ranging transformation. In 2008, we talked about another transformation to the 21st tech, uh, century technologies. In 2009, we talked about being forever redefined. In uh, 2011, a comprehensive overhaul and wide-ranging uh, transformation in 2012. Then in 2013, we changed the rhetoric to be an evolution. And really, when we talk about evolution, we think of millions of years. And so I get concerned about that. And then in the IG's report, he talks about the 2009 internal FAA study. And it said that you 
did not specifically address risk adjusted realistically reflect the risk uh, adjusted technology uh, in terms of feasible implementation and as promised that you your own internal survey so wouldn't you say isn't it fair to say that we have been maybe over ambitious and unconstrained with regards to what we hope that we can accomplish i don't think we have what we have adopted is a segmented approach to deployment of what is, we all agree, a very complex technological change and operational change in terms of how we move airplanes. And we have really... So you feel like you've accomplished I do. what you set out to do 10 years ago? I feel like we have, a, we have made significant progress toward a very significant change in how we manage air traffic. Let me give you a specific example. Fundamentally, the ADSB technology gives us a much clearer view of what's happening on, in the national airspace system. That is very different from radar. A way to think about it is a radar picture is sort of the equivalent of a somewhat fuzzy view of what's going on because it's limited by the sweep of the radar. What ADSB gives you is sort of the equivalent of HDTV. It's a much clearer and more precise view which enables you to move aircraft closer together. That makes for a much more efficient use of the system. And you, and you shared that in your and, opening testimony with regards to Atlanta and how we're able yeah. to do that. But, but really, help us understand, because NextGen was supposed to be this, you know, now we're, we're moving aircraft closer together, but from a lot of the stakeholders, we're, we're seeing that their concern is that the FAA and many of your employees are not buying in. It's not a buy-in uh, or a lack of a buy-in in terms of the stakeholders. It's really a, a lack of a buy-in in terms of many of the people that work for you. Is that not correct? No. Well, let, let's t it's, it actually goes both ways. Let's talk about what it enables. It enables performance-based navigation. And I talked about earlier how in order to successfully deploy performance-based navigation, it means we need to get everybody in a room. An airline might want a particular PBN procedure that is going to save fuel for them. They can request that we publish it, and in the old days, that's what we would have done. We would have published it, and then we would have found their operational difficulties with it, and it wouldn't have worked. What we're doing now is we're sitting down with the airline, the airport, the controllers, the military, and adjacent facilities in the metropolitan area to ask the question, okay, these guys would like to have this approach, which will reduce track miles flown, reduce their fuel burn. How do we make it happen? All right. So based and on these meetings that you've had over the last 10 years, what would you say is the probability of us seeing real transformation, not an evolution, but real transformation and redefining within the next 10 years? Are we going to make our two, uh, you know, 2025 deadline? I would, I, I, by what I read, I don't see any way that we can do that at this point. I, I don't know exactly what you would consider to be transformation, but I can say this. What would you consider transformation? I think we will be in a very different place where we will be handling more traffic, much more efficiently, with a higher level of safety, but if and we don't reducing know, fuel. Okay, but if we don't know where we're going, if we're just making good progress, we're still lost. And no, I, we do know where we're going. We have an enterprise architecture that has specific building blocks. I talked about the foundational programs that we're building where we're overlaying additional technological capability on top of it. And that is very clearly called out in the next-gen implementation plan that we publish every year, along with specific milestones and schedules for meeting them. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Johnson. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me express my appreciation to Administrator Erder and, the, and Inspector General Scoville for being here. Uh, of course, I've been listening to Next Gen's debate on this committee now for quite a while, and I think I know why quite a bit of it had not been implemented. It's hard to do it without money. But I do uh, look at the Attorney General's, um, the Inspector General's, fact that uh, controller policies and procedures have not been updated and remains an unresolved obstacle, which makes it uncertain when airspace users can expect widespread benefits. What is causing this delay other than 
some money, I know, uh, and updating the controller policies. And as an addendum to that question, uh, there is a small airport near Dallas in Mesquite, Texas. And I've had just about every airport around Dallas County now in the last 21 years or more. Uh, completed recently a new control tower funded uh, with the commitment that it would be furnished with air controllers. Now that it's finished, uh, they can't get a commitment or an answer as to whether or not they will get this um, air controller. Uh, could you comment on that and the previous question? Thank you. Um, let me talk first about the question that you asked with respect to how do we integrate with the controllers. One of the things that was identified in working with our industry stakeholders was that we needed to focus on rewriting the air traffic controller handbook, that that's a very important provision uh, in order to unlock the benefits of next gen. In July of last year, we set a goal for this year to make progress in rewriting the controller handbook to keep up with modern air traffic capabilities in the next gen era. And here is the specific issue we needed to address. What we needed to focus on is that what are the rules under which controllers will authorize and ensure that advanced navigation procedures can actually be operationalized, particularly in congested metropolitan areas? To accomplish this task effectively, we've been working with NATCA, with air traffic control management and the aviation community about the most important changes for each of these groups. And we found that the requested changes fell into two categories. Current standards that we needed to update as a result of new technology, and cases where changes had been made, but the criteria that I was talking about for conducting advanced operations had not been completely established. We identified a consolidated list of 15 specific changes that would enable us to address these issues. We expect to complete 10 of them by the end of this fiscal year, with the, with the following five to be completed thereafter. Now, we're, the revisions to the handbook are things that we have to be, be very careful about, and we have to do them in accordance with our safety management systems. Safety management systems are a systematic and continuous management process to proactively identify, analyze, and mitigate safety risk. And these 15 changes are just the first step as we continue to work collaboratively with our internal and external stakeholders to write a long-term plan and to address these specific operational problems that you're talking about. Going to your point about Mesquite, te Texas, I'll need to check into the specifics of that and we will provide a response okay. to you uh, after the hearing. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Scovo. Uh, you indicated in your written testimony that the FAA has made little progress in shifting from planning to implementation on next gen and delivering benefits to the airspace users. Would you please expand on this statement, explain how you are measuring that progress? It's very difficult to measure, and thanks, and that was exactly our point. Um, over the last 10 years, um, following um, FAA's, frankly, very, very ambitious statement of what its next-gen goals and what it believed would be achievable um, in its 2005 uh, progress report to Congress on next-gen, um, by 2009, those goals and the vision for next-gen had changed rather drastically from a 2025 completion date to at least 10 years later in the view of the JPDO and uh, the contractor who worked with them to complete that report, um, and to a final cost figure of two to three times the original $40 billion estimate. That had changed um, the picture drastically. Since then, there have been other problems with um, FAA's organization of its, of its next-gen effort. And now FAA finds itself confronted with a very difficult fiscal environment. Um, it's time for FAA to look in close consultation with the industry at what is most achievable in the short term. And our consultation with industry um, would lead us to recommend to, to FAA performance-based navigation, and we believe they're fully on board with that, continue their emphasis with the automation platforms, ERAM, and uh, substituting STARS for common arts at their uh, specific TRACON locations, 
and then confronting the critical design um, decisions that will be needed to make in order to fully maximize potential benefits from ADS-B and Datacom. And that is the level of automation that can be required and also the division of responsibility between cockpit and ground facilities for tracking and separating aircraft. Mm -hmm. Until those design uh, dis decisions are made, um, the true benefits of NextGen cannot be accomplished. Thank you both. I yield back. Time has expired. Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, Administrator Huerta, I appreciate you coming in, uh, as always, uh, taking the time to come up in, to the Hill. Uh, my question is a little bit different. It does deal with delays, however, but it is on uh, uh, technology delay, uh, which I was specifically speaking to some of the technology out there on uh, spin, uh, you know, or making aircraft uh, spin resistant, which has been going on forever. And I know ICON has got some new uh, technology out there, and they are trying to get an exemption. Uh, from the weight limit one and it comes to light sport, which was kind of arbitrarily uh, set. And I think that should be based on, on uh, performance and, and complexity of aircraft, but that is a whole other uh, issue. But I was surprised to find out that, that they have applied for an exemption that is 15 months old. And I have got letters here from, uh, from uh, Senator Enhoff and Congressman Petri and, and uh, various industry groups. Um, asking for some sort of resolution. I have got uh, a letter from the FAA, too, on this saying that they would have uh, a response uh, to their request from you all um, at the end of last year, uh, 2012. And, and I know I am kind of hitting you this, front, and I don't intend to hit you blindside. I just would like to get an answer, have you get back to me to give me an answer uh, on when they are going to have uh, some resolution, because they can't move this technology forward unless they get uh, uh, get an exemption and get an answer uh, to that. So I would appreciate uh, uh, that very much. Um, they need a decision on that. And I am always interested in new technology, and in particular when it comes to spin resistance. You know, Air Coop started this way back in the 1940s. Um, you know, now we have got ICON doing it, and it is fascinating as a pilot. Uh, it is fascinating, and that is one of the things obviously gets a lot of pilots in trouble, uh, is sure. getting into uh, stall spin situation. So. Uh, if sure. you got any comment on that, I'd sure appreciate it. Um, I'm not familiar with the status, Congressman Graves, but I'll, we'll get you a response. Okay, and I, and I was afraid of that, and I didn't mean to hit you um, blindside, and that's the reason I, I, I'm not going to press it today. But I would like a response um, right sure. away on that. I Absolutely. appreciate it, and thank you very much again for coming in. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Titus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator Huerta, thank you for being here. I, you know I represent Las Vegas, and tourism and air travel are key to our economy. Forty-five percent of the people who come to Las Vegas come through McCarran Airport. I talked to the folks at McCarran before this hearing because I wanted to get some feel for how they are dealing with the problems that we are addressing here and the next gen. And I am glad to report that they are pretty satisfied with what has happened. They give you uh, good marks for what has happened so far. But like most people in the comments you have heard today, they are concerned about when something else is going to happen, and they would like to see that sooner rather than later. Well, it sounds like from listening to you and to the, uh, the uh, Inspector General, that you are pretty aware of what the problems are. We are not telling you anything with these questions. Uh, it's the, I hear you talk about you have identified management problems, a resistant culture, the need for reliable data. You have addressed that with a monitor study, a change of personnel, better coordination with other agencies, more involvement with stakeholders. I appreciate all that. Um, the elephant in the room that nobody wants to really talk about is money. Now, you have had to deal with a sequester, but if you look at the latest Republican transportation appropriation bill, that cuts more than half a billion dollars from FAA. So how are you going to make any progress under those kind of circumstances? That is, that is a challenge. The, um, the House appropriations bill would significantly, in fact, uh, I would say devastate our facilities and equipment account. And that is the account through which we fund both the maintenance of our legacy infrastructure as well as the deployment of new capabilities. It's $623 million below the President's request and $439 million below where we are this year. 
And so it, it is um, a significant challenge. It's for that reason, as, um, as I was talking about with Mr. Larson, that we've asked industry to share with us what would be priorities if we need to deal with that. Personally, I believe that it is Im extremely important for us to stay the course. This is a very complex technological evolution, and it is one in which the United States has very significant leadership. We are working closely with our international stakeholders because air traffic is a global system and trying to ensure that uh, we have common procedures, common approaches to how we redesign the airspace, not just here in the United States, but internationally. And as a result of being where we are and the commitment that we have all made as a nation to this, we are in a very significant leadership position and in a, in a place where we can really drive what the international standards are going to be for the entire aviation system worldwide. I think that for us to step back from that becomes a very serious thing. Aviation was invented in America, and uh, we have always represented the cutting edge of technology, and it's important that we continue that. Mr. Ribble. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks. I want to thank both of you for coming back again. This is a little bit like Groundhog's Day for me. This sounds uh, a lot like last year's report that we got. Um, got a relatively rosy report um, from the agency and a relatively negative report from the Inspector General. And this year, um, kind of the same thing. Um, I guess I'll start with, with, with you, Mr. Scoble. You've made a lot of recommendations over the period of time, dozens and dozens and dozens of recommendations. How do you feel the FAA has been responding to those? Mm. Thank you, Mr. Ribble. Um, generally, FAA is responsive. Um, part of our audit process is to confer closely with the agency as we work our way through the audit. We have what's called an exit conference at the end where we present our findings and, and uh, planned recommendations. FAA always gives us. Um, a very thoughtful effort in their assessment of those recommendations and quite often concurs with those. Um, and we're pleased with that. Um, one, and it's, a, it's an administrative point for us, but it, one, it, it is one that, that worries us as auditors. Um, sometimes not only FAA but other agencies in the department take um, quite a bit of time to get their comments back to us and that raises questions to us about the timeliness and relevance of our work as well as um, perhaps even impingements on independence. But um, I would say our relationship overall with regard to our recommendations with FAA is quite good. Um, we have a number of open recommendations from past reports, specifically regarding NextGen. I could tick off a couple of those that um, we consider uh, most significant. Um, by the way, we've, we've briefed FAA on our tentative findings on the, the current audit that forms the basis for our testimony this morning. We intend to focus our recommendations first on the critical path for next-gen implementation. Um, we will focus as well on FAA's reorganization of its next-gen implementation entities um, to try to drive at some of the programmatic and organizational challenges that we discuss in our statement regarding leadership, organizational culture, um, and the sense of urgency. Our past recommendations um, from April 2012 um, the highlight of, the, of those recommendations was that for an integrated master schedule. Um, in fact, we've highlighted before this committee and also before the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee, that is one of our top five open recommendations across the entire Department of Transportation. The integrated master schedule, we believe, would form the basis for FAA to, pay, to make better informed choices regarding priorities and sequencing and also the, the consequences of decisions. Uh, downrange, the ripple effect, if you will, specifically concerning time. That gets us to delay, and we understand from the users that that is their principal pain point right now, is the perception, at least, that there has been a lot of time and undue delay in implementing next-gen capabilities. But we've also recommended to FAA that they document inter interdependencies between systems and procedures. That was in June 2010. That they identify critical path issues or decisions in terms of airspace changes. And finally, that they assess safety and implementation risks of mixed equipage operations and develop corresponding mitigation strategies and policies. All those recommendations and, and those last three remain open from 2010, in fact, 
Um, we understand FAA has been working to implement them, but until we have further meetings and, frankly, documentation from the agency, we will not close them because we want to be able to report to the Congress that um, FAA has indeed responded fully to the intent as well as to the letter of those recommendations. All right, thank you. And Mr. Mr. Herda, um, you talked a little bit about uh, earlier about the culture of safety at FAA. And I, and I, I really want to commend FAA. Um, I, I get an airplane every single weekend, and quite frankly, I never even think about safety. The, the, the airline industry and, and what FAA and NTSB have done over the last several decades has been a stunning achievement, quite frankly, um, to the point that you get an airplane and you, you fly all over the country and not even be concerned about it, to be quite, quite honest with you. Is it possible, however, and I've seen this in other organizations where a culture of safety, uh, I've seen employees who are so safety focused that they hop on a parallel path of a culture of fear. Where, where fear now pervades, the fear of making any mistake whatsoever <clears throat> inhibits them from making any change at all whatsoever, and it can impede progress. Are, are you observing any of that? Is there any concern of that? That is something that had, has been a concern of the aviation industry in general for a long time, and I think the industry in its totality, and the FAA is a part of this, have really tried to address that, he that issue head on through non-punitive reporting mechanisms where individuals, if they identify a problem, they can do so without fear of retribution. Um, on the carrier side, it is programs such as ASAP where they can identify issues uh, that uh, might represent a safety risk so that they can be dealt with. And the air traffic side, our counterpart is ATSAP, where controllers can identify are there procedural issues, are there challenges. I think what you are talking about is extremely important. It is something that we are very focused on, and it is really the, the entire underpinning of our collaborative efforts to try to bring all the stakeholders together and recognize that air traffic management is a shared responsibility. Everyone wants to see a safe system, an efficient system, and they want it to be adaptable to new technologies and to new operational characteristics. That's a very positive development. The downside of it is it takes time because it requires you to build levels of trust, levels of understanding, and a familiarity and working relationship, which is really critical to ensure that you are able to deliver actual benefit. While it takes longer, I am all for it because you get a better result out of the back end. It is a result that sticks and it is a result that people can actually use and which really d delivers benefits. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Scoville, you, you talked a little bit about the integrated master schedule. Did you say and did I miss what you believe the status of the integrated master schedule is? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I didn't say, and I appreciate the opportunity to clarify that, FAA is working on that recommendation. We are in, we're informed that by December of this, this year, FAA anticipates completing that work. We will have a chance to look at it. We will assess whether it meets um, the intent and letter of the recommendation and perhaps be in a position to close it at that point. But you do believe that is key to how we move forward? It is key. And the effort is underway on, on the part of FAA. Hey, um, you uh, you have identified uh, some of the challenges in development and Im implementation of next gen. Um, could, could you tell us what you believe uh, the problems are? I mean, is, it, is this funding related? Is it organizationally related? What, what, what do you believe is the root of this? Mr. Chairman, we don't believe, um, looking at the past record, that funding has been a problem. Congress has been fairly generous with the agency for its next-gen lines of business to the tune of $3.6, $3.8 billion. As I mentioned earlier, FAA has really had the luxury of being able to try to proceed on a pretty broad front across transformational programs, longer range, as well as um, trying its hand at, at some of the near-term improvements that the users have been most uh, eager for. Now the, the situation is different with regard to funding, and FAA will have to make uh, some very tough priority decisions in consultation with the users. However, there are programmatic and, and organizational challenges um, that uh, are outlined in our statement concerning organizational culture, um, inconsistent leadership, 
leading to uh, a different uh, messaging of, of vision and so forth. Programmatic um, problems have led to um, some of the technical uh, difficulties that the agency has encountered, specifically with ERAM. That would be the best example of that, but that we anticipate that the agency will also encounter as it modernizes its automation platforms in the TRACON facilities. So all of those uh, technical, programmatic, uh, organizational challenges persist in NextGen. We would say, um, while funding in the past may not uh, have been a problem, certainly it's, as was mentioned earlier, it's the elephant in the room for FAA in this committee today. Do you have any specific recommendations for either Congress in general or the Transportation Committee or the Aviation Subcommittee of, of what additionally we can or should do to help move this along? Mm. Uh, I think Administrator Huerta has laid out a pretty good outline of where he thinks the agency needs to go in order to advance next gen, even facing the difficult uh, fiscal challenges that we all know he does face today. I would urge the committee and Congress to hold FAA's feet to the fire. Please use our office as your uh, tool to help you do that. Um, we would welcome the opportunity to further work with you and the agency to review FAA's programs, its plans, um, to see whether it has made good on much of what Administrator Huerta has said today regarding prioritization, further collaboration with users, its workforce as well, the near-term steps for PBN and Metroplex improvements, finishing off automation platform uh, modernization with with ERAM and um, what must be done at the trade cons, and then confronting the very difficult critical design decisions regarding divisional responsibility between cockpit and ground facilities and, and the level of automation. Because only when those decisions are finally made, and they are difficult policy decisions, not, not uh, within the purview of my office, but certainly for the agency and the committee, then um, the, the long-range benefits of ADSB and Datacom can be put in place. If final benefits are, are ever to be felt by the taxpayer, we believe it will be in FAA's ability to consolidate and realign its facilities um, as ADSB fully reaches its potential, um, perhaps to make adjustments to the workforce, certainly to um, close some of its most aging facilities and to consolidate those. But those are difficult policy decisions for the administration and for the Congress. Mr. Wirtz, is there anything additional you can think of or suggest that, uh, that we can do from this end to help you in your efforts to this humongous task? I think that it is important that we all recognize that this is a very large and complex program. And as we have talked about, we have built an excellent foundation where we can now add additional capabilities. I think that, uh, you know, as you heard from the Inspector General, you know, we have been um, in, in discussions and have been responsive to many of the recommendations made by the Inspector General. And in fact, in their most recent review of the ERAM program, the Inspector General acknowledged that significant progress had been made in getting that program back on track. I think that where the committee can be helpful is to go back to where we were with FAA reauthorization and recognize that we had all identified as a country that this is an extremely important initiative to enable us to provide support and to maintain leadership for an aviation industry. We all knew then that it was an incredibly complex undertaking, but that the cost of not doing it greatly exceeded the cost of doing that. And we need to keep that in mind as we go through this difficult climate in the years ahead. Thank you. Mr. Larson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. First off, uh, I'd ask unanimous consent to enter uh, some QFRs from Mr. Nolan. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, Inspector General Scoville, getting back to some of the things you've noted, but you've testified initial plans for next gen targeted 2025 and at a cost of $40 billion. Uh, and, and your office said those were overambitious and unconstrained. Could and you have talked about some of the specific concepts and capabilities that were part of initial plans for next gen and whether uh, FAA is on track to achieve them by 2025. Can you pick, is there a poster child for, for this? 
for the failure to meet a, right. a 2025 deadline? Yeah. Hmm. I would say I would say it's a combination, sir, between uh, ADSB and Datacom at this point. Um, Progress made on ADSB in terms of installing the ground infrastructure, although that's been delayed from 2013 to 2014, so we continue to see some friction there. Demonstration projects in line and underway, greater coverage in areas where we don't have um, radars, uh, Gulf of Mexico and, and Alaska, for instance, um, a few other demonstration projects around the country. But as far as being able to demonstrate to users who will bear the ultimate and quite large bill to equip with ADSB in, um, and that, that will be the game changer for them as, as well as for FAA, um, the, the agency hasn't yet been able to confront those decisions. And it may truly be simply a matter of time, and in a couple of years they'll be able to do that. But if that slips, 2025 is, is well off the table. Datacom is, a, is an essential program for NextGen, but it's a program that has had uh, its, its own fits and starts through the years. You, you may remember, sir, that it began initially in 2003. Um, after $100 million investment, it was terminated in 2005 for technical difficulties, among other problems. It was resurrected last year. Um, it's an expensive program, but users have long memories and they see that some users um, in the middle part of the last decade actually spent to equip and then had, in their view, um, the rug pulled out from under them when FAA had to terminate the program in 2005. They are very reluctant to repeat what they view as that mistake. And so they want to see FAA make solid, consistent, and um, prolonged progress on Datacom before they're going to spend more money on it. Uh, if ADSB and Datacom continue to um, lag in their view, um, there's no chance of 2025. Thanks. Before I ask uh, Mr. Huerta to comment, uh, I just never thought I'd be here long enough to have anybody say, you might remember back in 2003. Um, <clears throat> it's getting to be here a little long. Uh, Administrator Huerta, you testified, though, in your written testimony, FAA is delivering next gen on time and on target. Here are a couple examples where there's some obvious concerns. Can you can you address that? Yes, um, the the premise that as a result of individual delays causing the whole program to be delayed, I think, is fundamentally not correct because what. NextGen is a series of interrelated programs, and admittedly, we have experienced delays with some of them. But the approach is also based very much on ensuring that we have the flexibility to recover from them and to ensure that uh, we can reorder delivery of things so that we can meet the overall objective of the endpoint uh, delivery of benefit that we've always talked about. I would like to address the two things that uh, the Inspector General has talked about, ADSB and Datacom, as illustrative examples. ADSB capability is truly foundational, and uh, we are uh, delivering the ground station, and that will complete that aspect of the project. Uh, what uh, the Inspector General talked about was how do we ensure equipage for ADSB in? Well, one of the things that we felt that was important was that we need to consult with industry to understand what are the dyna dynamics associated with that and what are the things they want to see. So we convened an aviation rulemaking committee to provide advice to us and to uh, raise issues that they want to make sure that we take account of before we were to issue a mandate. And we have done that, and uh, that is something that uh, we are carefully evaluating. As I talked about earlier, it is a necessary consultative step. It takes time, but it gets us to a better outcome. Because what I don't want to have on the back end is a big fight about whether we have got it right. We want to get it right the first time. And uh, that ultimately enables us to um, ensure expeditious deployment when the time comes. On Datacom, this is one that is at a very critical point, And um, it is critical not only from the, well, there are three factors that affect it. One is the capabilities that it will actively, uh, that, that will be deployed as a result of that. 
The second is ensuring that we have the highest levels of coordination with our European counterparts who are looking to deploy a similar technology. We want to ensure interoperability and consistency across the Atlantic. And working with them on standards and on calendars is extremely important. And the final point is funding. That is a program that is just getting underway. And as the Inspector General pointed out, it is a game changer. It is one that uh, really does cause a significant operational benefit. But given where it is in its planning cycle and our funding uh, choices, that is one uh, that does very much concern me in terms of its affordability. Right. Thank you. I have further questions being for a third round, but I see some other members return. No. Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to follow up a little bit, uh, uh, Mr. Warda, when, when we were talking about successes earlier, you brought up uh, the ADS system and, uh, and, and it being a success of next gen. And yet when I look at your testimony, when, you know, the, the high, where you highlight it, uh, you know, you talk about UPS being able to save some fuel, you talk about JetBlue being able to save 100 miles. Uh, it, it doesn't sound like a great success story. In fact, when I talk to many of the people in the industry, their comment is, is that ADS, for all practical reasons, is not being used. How, how would you comment on that? Well, what it enables is the use of performance-based navigation. I know it enables that, but and is it being used? And that's what they want, and that's what the Metroplex program is focused on delivering. I understand that's what it's focused on. Is it being used? It is. A across the industry. So it if is. I went out to all the stakeholders, the, the majority of them would say, this is a great success, this is worth spending $40 billion on to implement it and use it. Is it being used that way? I think if we worked through particular metropolitan areas, they would acknowledge that they are seeing benefit. I talked about Atlanta, how we're able to increase departure rates at Atlanta. I talked about North Texas, how we're able to deconflict. But that wasn't in your testimony, but, but you're saying that that's a direct success of ADS? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so if I called the Uniteds and all of them, they would say, they would agree with you that Delta, that they would this is a, a great success, and they would be applauding you on this. They would agree that what we have been able to deliver as a result of technology is more performance-based navigation procedures. Now, they still want more, and they are not completely where they want to be, but they would say that, yes, they do benefit in particular programs. So how do we measure success? You know, I'm all about results and, and not spending this. And, and earlier we talked about success. The IG has been very detailed and perhaps some would say critical in terms of where we've been with this. At what matrix do we look at, since most of the stakeholders are saying that we haven't really adopted ADS, you've put in, you know, it gets back to what Mr. Williams said, you know, he's, he's using a flip phone. Mm -hmm. I, c I can use a smartphone if all I'm doing is making phone calls. It doesn't do me any good. And that's what it sounds like. We've got a lot of technology out there that is not really being implemented across your agency or used fully. Would you agree with that? I would agree with the point that as you deploy technology, <clears throat> there is a period of time where utilization needs to catch up with it. That's the case for any technological sure. evolution. And that our focus needs to be on how do you ensure that users are taking advantage of technology that's already deployed. So how do you ensure that? Because to date, we haven't really assured that. So how would you? Well, we are. What we're, this, that's entirely what our focus on performance-based navigation is all about. Now, we have put on our website and we have made available specific metrics. How are we actually doing? in meeting the business objectives that the users have associated with the deployment of these. So well, who, who puts forth the grade? I mean, you put it on the website, how are we meeting it? Who grades you out? Ultimately, it only works if it's delivering benefit to the users. And I understand that. And I understand that we have to continue to focus on what it is that they require for the delivery of the capabilities that they want. We get that. and. And that's why when we hear criticism like, I am not benefiting in this particular area, 
Last summer, there was a lot of discussion around a particular runway configuration in Chicago. We focused in on what could we do to eliminate conflicts through the use of PBN, and we have been successful in doing that. Uh, before that, there was a lot of concern. What could I do to focus on increasing capacity in Atlanta? That is what led to that uh, 10 percent increase in departures. All right. I see we I'm need running, to be I'm, responsive. I am running out of time, so if you can answer this last question for me. Out of the industry, out of the mm. stakeholders, mm. what percentage of the stakeholders are using ADS and really seeing a significant advantage out of that? What, what percentage of the stakeholders are using it? I think a better way for us to respond to that is what percentage of time are procedures actually being used in particular metropolitan areas? And we can get you some information on that. Well, I, I would like the answer to the other question I ask you, too. What percentage of stakeholders? And with that, I, I thank the Chairman. I will yield back. Ms. Johnson. Thank you very much. I would just like to um, ask if I can depend on uh, your department to have a briefing with my office as it relates to Mesquite Airport. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Scoville, um, do, you, do you think that ADSB is being widely used now? No, I don't think it is being wi widely used now. Um, in some locations, sure, over the Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, for instance, Philadelphia, Memphis, areas where demonstration projects are in place. Elsewhere, we don't think it is. And as far as being an enabler, um, requirement for uh, use by the users of, of PBN, performance-based navigation, in specific metropolitan areas, our review of uh, the FAA data shows that it is not either. For instance, our statement um, notes that in three major metropolitan areas um, where RNP procedures are in, in place, um, Chicago, New York, and right here in Washington, only 3 percent of the eligible flights are able to use those RNP procedures. And the sticking block in, in most instances is with the, not the controllers themselves or, or their, their outlook, but I mean to say their, their training and their ability to, uh, to manage those advanced procedures. Um, they don't have the tools. They don't have the handbook. They don't have the, the policies. They haven't had the training. It's, it's entirely understandable and proper that they should decline to grant authorization um, to aircraft that request to use RNP under those circumstances. But um, if we don't have the ultimate, um, the ultimate enabler, in other words, in, in many instances it is with the controllers at this point uh, and their level of training, then um, the advanced procedures, the ADSB, um, they won't get that, that user and that aircraft across the goal line. You want to comment? What I would add is, which is why we are so focused on dealing with how we make this operational in focused on, focusing on the controller handbook, focusing on working with all of the stakeholders, and uh, ensuring that a procedure is not published. I mean, as we, when we deploy a new procedure, what we have to focus on in very granular terms is who wants to use it, who is able to use it, and how does it mix with other traffic in that area. And we can only do that, not in a big global training session, but by working with specific work groups in specific metropolitan areas to really focus on very precise procedures and how do we ensure that they get used. That is what the Metroplex initiative is all about. And while people may be critical that it doesn't take time, I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that we have invested significantly in trying to tackle that specific problem. And we are seeing benefit as a result of it. Uh, really, I mean, this, I think we're, this has been very good and, and very helpful for us to sort of understand a little bit better. Uh, to, it, uh, trying to be fair, w from a time frame, do you think we would um, have additional positive news three months, six months, a year? I mean, what, what, 
What do you think it will take to get to another level here, Mr. Huerta? The thing that I am most concerned about is the fiscal uncertainty between now and going into the next fiscal year, and here is why. We have spent a lot of time talking about delivering benefit and ensuring the users have that. And you have heard from me that the way we ensure that we are able to deliver benefit is through very intensive collaborative processes with industry, with controllers, and with the agency in, in very granular terms about ensuring that we are able to take advantage of the technology that we are deploying. That costs money. And that is something that is, has been, for me, a very high priority with how we use our operating and our F&E resources. And as we look at an uncertain fiscal climate, it presents us with a choice that we don't like, which is do we retreat to a base operation and not try to do new things, or do we continue to stay the course on deploying of these new advanced technologies so that we can deliver the very benefits that we all say that we want to deliver. And as I look at where we are in the balance of this fiscal year and the uncertainty we face going into next year, we do have to resolve that question. Thank you. Mr. Larson. Thank you. Uh, Inspector General Scoville, in your written testimony, you stated the FAA hadn't yet made a key design decision regarding how much responsibility for tracking aircraft would be delegated to pilots versus the duties that would remain for air traffic controllers. Could you explain why that is a key decision? Thank you, Mr. Larson. Yes, it is a key decision because um, heretofore pilots haven't had that responsibility. Right. It is uh, rested with controllers on the ground. Uh, for pilots to undertake that, um, of course, their, their employers will have to agree. They are going to have to be trained. The aircraft will have to be equipped. Controllers will have to um, change their outlook um, from one of air traffic control to air traffic management. It's, uh, that really is a revolutionary step. step. Um, right now, it appears to us that um, until ADSB in is were to be mandated uh, and those requirements specified, it is very much an open question as to whether that delegation of responsibility to the cockpit is going to take place. Right. Administrator Huerta, would you care to respond? Do you still see this happening? I do see it happening, but I differ with the Inspector General that there is a magic day where a decision is made and everything changes. What I, the way I would characterize it is that as we deploy technology, we need to work through respective responsibilities of the users of the system in terms of what they actually mean. NextGen, by definition, is a transformation from a command and control environment, as the Inspector General pointed out, to a shared responsibility for air traffic management. But how we deploy that is what we need to discuss. And that is something that is not a black and white, we decide that one day and move forward. That is an operational discussion of actually how do we make that real in specific congested airspace. Okay. Inspector General uh, Scoville, with regards to the design, design de decision on the number and locations of air traffic, facilities needed to support NextGen uh, as a key decision? Could you lay out why the IG says that is a key decision? Number and design of facilities, sir? Yes. Yeah. Um, it is a key decision because if um, the full potential of all of NextGen's Gen, programs are to be realized, it might be possible for the current configuration of the NAS to be very radically different from today in terms of the number of facilities, their location, and the workforce that is required to staff them. Um, as, as the administrator has pointed out, that is a, a, a continuing discussion that needs to take place. Yeah. Um, both the, the agency and the committee, uh, the full Congress, need to understand what the, the possibilities are in that, in that area and then make the difficult policy decision as to whether to embark in that direction. After all, in the bottom one of, the, one of the final analysis is jobs, and we are also talking about Federal presence in areas across the entire country, um, north, south, east, west. 
Um, the will of the Congress will be paramount in that area, but it is not one and it is not a decision that um, can rest exclusive with, exclusively with the agency or with the industry. We acknowledge that. Difficult policy matter, continuing discussions have to take place. Administrator Huerta, any further comment on that? I agree. Oh, great. Um, I have a, uh, a question from uh, a member who is not on the committee. I just I'll want to ask it. This is for Administrator Huerta, and it does deal with uh, if the Chairman will indulge me with uh, Asiana Flight 214 about testing of uh, employees of foreign carriers and whether or not they should be uh, required to undergo mandatory drug and alcohol testing following a crash in the U.S. We require that for domestic pilots of domestic carriers, but are not able, apparently, to require of foreign pilots of foreign carriers. Does the FAA have a position on changing that? Sure. Uh, as you know, the FAA does require U.S. operators to conduct drug testing of pilots following accidents. And you also pointed out that FAA regulations do not apply to foreign pilots or foreign airlines. To, um, in order to do that, we would need to undertake a rulemaking. But I want to step back for a minute and talk about the broader global context in which this operates. Changes to international standards on post-accident drug and alcohol testing are most likely to occur if there is multilateral support from many countries, and the forum through which that is done is the International Civil Aviation Organization. Now, um, ICAO standards do not presently require that member states uh, establish biochemical testing programs to detect or to deter inappropriate drug or alcohol use. However, what they have is something called a recommended practice. And the recommended practice uh, states that ICAO member states, states shall ensure, as far as practicable, that all license holders who engage in any kind of problematic use of substances are identified and removed from their safety critical functions. Now, we as a U.S. government believe that the global aviation community would greatly benefit from the development of clearer ICAO standards in that regard and would be supportive of those efforts. And uh, we believe that it is appropriate to work that in a multilateral context. I would caution against unilateral regulatory uh, action on the part of the U.S. because we have to consider the implication of other states taking unilateral actions that would affect our crews and our carriers in their respective countries. And so we would push to deal with this in the international setting through ICAO. I understand. And uh, finally, my, my last question is, uh, is I had asked in my opening statement about the letter I sent to you all sure. about Metroplex, uh, sending down Metroplex initiatives because of sequestration and was looking forward to a formal response. I will be providing you a formal response shortly in writing, but to, to highlight uh, some of the things I will be talking about in that. The collaborative part of the Metroplex pro program was stood down in mid-April under these were the collaborative work groups that we have uh, for air traffic controllers in anticipation of needing to return controllers to their home facilities in order to move air traffic as a result of reduced hours. We approved the restart of these projects starting uh, after, the, uh, this, after the, we received the one-time authority to enable us to cancel the furlough. And we have designated funding for operations facilities and engineering activities um, in the affected en route and terminal air traffic control facilities in order to enable these projects to move forward. We are still assessing what the long-term impact of that is on schedule because of necessity uh, we need now to reassemble teams, get caught up in terms of uh, work that was underway in order to enable us to uh, take this high priority program and get it back to uh, where it needs to be. But yes, we did uh, have to reduce those activities as a result of the sequester. Yeah, and under a CR environment, I assume that could continue under a, what I would put long odds on, under a regular order environment where we actually pass all the bills by, appropriations bills by. October 1st, that would continue, but under a uh, sequestration environment, uh, you'd have to return to that, uh, re return to making a decision on whether to continue those. Absolutely, because under a CR environment with sequester, we would say a see a very significant reduction to our operating budget, and that's how we fund this. And that's how you fund that. Yeah, good. All right. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mr. Huerta. 
Mr. Scoville, we thank you very much. Um, and this has been very helpful. I, I hope we can continue to work together to try to try to see future progress. And uh, with that, the hearing is adjourned. <laughs>